Today I'd like to start things off with a little game. So take a second and look around you and count all the things, all the devices around you that have batteries in it. Here, I'll do it with you. Uh, the computer that I'm recording this on has a battery on it. Camera has a battery on it. Mouse has batteries that are uncovered for some reason. Phone. I got a sound recorder over here. I got my GoPro. GoPro has a battery on it. Uh, oh, microphone pack. The point is our lives revolve around portable power. Batteries literally make our lives possible. And that trend is only accelerating, especially with the growing pace of electric cars. So the race is on to develop newer, better energy storage solutions. Our old friend, the AA battery, the nickel cadmium battery, it's done a good job, but it, it's not rechargeable. You can only use it once. It's very wasteful. You throw it away. Lithium ion batteries are rechargeable, but they take a really long time to charge and they eventually lose effectiveness. But there is a third option on the way. It's called supercapacitors. They charge immediately, they run forever, and they never wear down. There's just one thing we still have to figure out. Super Answer File Matt Herring asks, can you do a video on supercapacitors? Matt asked this question as a premier supporter on Patreon. If you want to know how to do the same, of course, as always, go to patreon.com slash answerswithjoe. So how many times have you been texting somebody, um, doing general phone things, and then all of a sudden, Oh man, your plans have suddenly changed. You've got to go find a cord and plug in. You got to sit next to the electric thing if you want to keep doing your phone stuff. I mean, the hell man. Are we living in 2017 or aren't we? So before I can explain how supercapacitors will fix this, I need to back up and show you how batteries work in the first place. The simplest explanation is batteries transfer electrons from a negatively charged electrode called an anode to a positively charged electrode called a cathode. And the device that the battery is powering siphons electrons off to power that device. For example, nickel cadmium batteries use a nickel oxide cathode in a cadmium anode, hence the name. And it produces electrons through a chemical process called oxidation, which is used by an electrolyte layer sandwiched between the two electrodes. In the case of nickel cadmium batteries, they use potassium hydroxide as the electrolyte. But this is a one-shot deal. It produces electrons, but there's no way to reintroduce electrons into the mix. So they're not rechargeable. And in a world that's increasingly reliant on portable devices, that's just not good enough. Enter lithium ion batteries, which were developed back in the 1970s by a guy named John B. Goodenough. That's his real name. And yes, I'm, I know, thank you. I'm, I'm very proud to be the first person to ever tell that joke. It was, uh, it was, it was hard, but I, I pulled it off. Lithium ion batteries, according to my analytics anyway, are responsible for powering the screens that about 75% of you are watching right now. Lithium ion batteries have a cathode made of lithium, duh, and an anode made of carbon, again, with an electrolyte layer sandwiched in between. The difference is lithium can absorb more electrons, so it can be recharged, which is great. But it's still a chemical reaction, meaning it takes some time for that charge to take place. Supercapacitors work differently. Instead of using a chemical reaction to produce electrons, also known as an electrochemical process, they use static electricity, also known as an electrostatic process. Ever shocked yourself on a doorknob after walking across carpet? That's basically how supercapacitors work. Now, capacitors have been in our computers for decades, and they basically work by holding opposing charges on two metal plates separated by a dielectric material. And much like that doorknob shock, the amount of electricity they carry is really tiny, but it transfers really quickly. Supercapacitors, as you may have already figured out, are larger versions of capacitors that actually double up those metallic plates so that they can hold more energy. In fact, they're often called double layer capacitors. And the cool thing is since it's an electrostatic process instead of a chemical process, there's far less resistance to charge. In fact, it's almost instantaneous. The problem is they don't hold that much energy. In fact, you would have to have a vast amount of surface area in order to be able to get anywhere near the kind of storage capacity that a lithium ion battery has. So lithium ions have a high energy density, meaning they hold a lot of electricity, whereas supercapacitors have a very high power density, meaning they can transfer that energy much faster. So if, theoretically, you could have supercapacitors with the same energy density as lithium ion batteries, you'd be able to charge your phone in seconds and be good for the rest of the day. And with wireless charging on the forefront, you might just be able to just set it down on a pad while you're eating breakfast and you're good to go. You could charge your laptop in the time it takes you to take a whiz. And dare we dream it, an EV that actually charges faster than it takes to pump gas. That is the dream. And there is one material that can make this dream a reality. It's called graphene. Graphene is basically a one layer thick lattice of carbon atoms, and it has some just insane properties. It's 200 times stronger than steel, but incredibly light. It's biodegradable, it's biocompatible, meaning you can use it inside the human body. 
They say it can be used to desalinate seawater, it can build space elevators, it can be the basis of supercomputers, but for our purposes, it also happens to be one of the most electrically capacitive substances known to man. It has the same energy density as lithium ion batteries, but with the power density of supercapacitors. And since it's only one atom thick, you can cram a lot of surface area in a tiny space. But much like the highly lauded carbon nanotubes, which are basically just tubes made out of graphene, these are very, very hard to make. In fact, nothing I'm saying here is really all that new. We've been hearing about supercapacitors made out of graphene since about 2013. One of our very most frustrating technology holdups we have today, actually. But it's not for lack of trying. In fact, some of the smartest people alive today are working feverishly to find a solution to this, and in the last couple of years, there's been some interesting developments. One group found that heating soybean oil to 800 degrees Celsius on a nickel foil caused the carbon atoms to arrange themselves in a one-layer lattice basically graphene. So far they've only created a small credit card size sample, but it's still a proof of concept. Another idea that could prove to be scalable is igniting acetylene and oxygen, which causes the atoms to arrange themselves in that lattice over a large surface area. The problem is it doesn't really arrange it in that one atom thick layer that we need. It's a lot more chunky. But it is a method that could be tweaked to get the result that they want. Bottom line is the person or group that finds a solution to this problem is going to be seriously seriously rich. So because of that, there's a lot of people who are incentivized to work on it, and that's a good thing. With any luck, in 10 or 15 years, we'll have supercapacitor batteries that can handle energy densities at industrial scales, giving us fast, easy electricity whenever we need it. In the meantime, our old friend John B. Goodenough and his colleague Helena Braga have worked on a new battery that uses a solid electrolyte that many are calling the impossible battery. It stores three times as much energy as a lithium ion and uses a sodium anode, so it's biodegradable and all the materials are cheap and easy to come by. 94 years old and still innovating. Good show, old chap. There is also the idea of hybrid batteries that contain both a lithium ion and supercapacitors, so you get the best of both worlds. Now this of course was a very high level view, there's a lot of pros and cons of supercapacitors and you can learn more about it in the links that I put down in the description, but let's talk about it in the comments. What do you think? Do you think that the promise of supercapacitors is overhyped? Why or why not? I for one think that this is a nut that we're going to crack. I mean there's just such an incentive for a person or a company to figure this out that somebody's going to do it eventually. And it will probably be insanely expensive for a while, all new technologies are, but I mean just look at cell phones in the way once it becomes, you know, normal and adopted, it takes off, uh, you know, but I really think that once this gets figured out, it could be a real fundamental shift in the way we live our lives, especially when it comes to things like electric cars. So thanks to Matt for this question. I thought it was a very relevant question, and uh, I'm actually really glad I did this research because, I, like I said, I've been hearing about this for a long time, kind of fell off the radar, but it, it turns out there's actually some cool developments on the way. Gives me some hope that this is gonna uh, change things pretty soon. And I'm telling you, like, if you're looking for a field to get into, material science is the way to go. That's, that's where all the major innovations that are gonna just change the world are coming from. So that's my suggestion, look into material science. I also wanna thank all my other supporters on Patreon. We're at over 120 now, which is crazy pants, but uh, I wanted to give a shout out to the people who have joined since the last video. We got Michael Lewis, Jean-Claude Lemaine, uh, Margaret Cooley, Greg Forsyth, Stephen Hughes, Pete Finnegan, Michael Lungberg, Mason Petrosky, Ajit, and Chris from Legion of Weirdos, who I got to hang out with at uh, VidCon. He's actually got a great channel himself. Go check that out if you like my kind of stuff. And as always, the sponsor for this video is Cankerboy.com. If you get canker sores and mouth ulcers on a regular basis, like I do, bane in my existence, I've had them my whole life, this is a supplement that actually prevents you from getting them. It works. You can give it a try. Just go to Cankerboy.com. Like and share if you liked it, and if this is your first time here, I encourage you to go check out some of my other videos, because I talk about similar topics like this every Monday, and if you like that, maybe subscribe, because I'm going to keep doing them. Alright, thanks a lot for watching. You guys go out and have an eye-opening week, and I will see you next Monday. Love you guys. Take care.